Hey, and welcome to um, another edition of You Down MMT. Basically, the uh, I'm I am uh, reading directly from the monetary theory uh, macroeconomic textbook. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the authors of this. Anyway, so I'm in chapter nine, introduction to sovereign currency, the government, and its money. In 9.1, in the introduction, in this chapter, we will examine in more detail several of the concepts briefly induced, induced, introduced in earlier chapters of this textbook. We first turn to the money of account and the nation's currency and note that the latter is no longer backed by a precious metal such as gold. We argue that the so-called fiat currency is valued and widely used in transactions because it requires uh, it required as a means to pay taxes and other obligations levied by the state. All financial stocks and flows are denominated in a nation national money of account. In this context, the financial system can be viewed as a record of transactions. That is a scoreboard. We then examine the differences or difference between floating and fixed exchange rate systems. Government and non-government IOUs are denominated in a national currency or money of account. After defining leveraging, leveraging used, uh, use of debt, uh, we argue that these uh, different types of IOUs can be conceived as uh, as a financial pyramid with government IOUs at the top. Finally, we emphasize the need to use the term money very carefully to avoid confusion. Uh, in 9.2, the national currency unit of account. Let us look at money. Uh, look at money as the unit of account in which stocks and flows are denominated. One nation, one currency. In Chapter 6, we introduced the concept of money of account, the Australian dollar, the U.S. dollar, the Japanese yen, and the British pound, and the European euro are all examples of the money of account. This first four are each associated with a single nation which through, uh, throughout history has been the, un uh, the usual situations. One nation, one currency associated with the single nation, which, uh, oh wait, I've already read that one, my bad, uh, currency. Uh, there have been a few exceptions to the rule, including the modern uh, euro, which is the money of account uh, adopted by several countries that are joined the e Economic and Monetary Union of the European Union, or EMU. When we address the uh, the exceptional cases such as the EMU, we will carefully identify the differences that arise when a currency is used by not uh, but not issued by a nation. Most of the discussion that follows will be focused on the more common case in which a nation adopts its own money of account. The government of the nation issues a currency, usually consisting consisting of metal coins and paper notes of various denominations denominated in its money of account, spending by the government as well as tax liabilities, fees, and fines owed to the government are denominated in the same money of account. These payments are enforceable by law. More generally, broad use of the nation's money of account is issued by or insured by enforcing monetary contracts in a, in a court of law, such as the payment of wages. In many nations, there are private contracts that are written in foreign monies of accounts. For example, in some Latin American countries, it is common to write some kinds of contracts in terms of the U.S. dollar. It is also common in many nations to use the U.S. currency in payment. Many contracts governing international trade are denominated in U.S. dollars, even if neither party used the specific currency as their own. According to some estimates, the total value of U.S. paper currency circulating outside America exceeds the value of U.S. paper currency used at home. Much of the uh, much of this thought to be involved in illegal activities, including the drug trade, uh, the drug trade. Thus, one of or more 
foreign monies of account as well as the corresponding foreign currencies might be used in addition to the domestic money of account and the domestic currency that denominated in that unit. Sometimes that is explicitly recognized and permitted by the authorities, while other times it is uh, it is part of the underground economy that tries to avoid detection by using foreign currency. While we recognize these de deviations from the one currency, one nation rule, they generally account for a re relative, uh, relatively small proportion of transactions and uh, contracts, most of which will be denominated in a nation's own currency of account. So the currency and the, and the currency, the national currency is often referred to as sovereign currency. That is the currency issued by the sovereign government. The sovereign government retains a variety of powers for itself that are not given to private individuals or institutions. Here we are only concerned with those powers associated with money. The sovereign government's uh, government alone has the power to determine which money of account it will recognize for official accounts. Further, modern sovereign governments alone are invested with the power to issue, issue the currency denominated in each nation's money for account. For example, if any entity that uh, other than the U.S. government tried to use or issue U.S. currency, it would, would be prosecuted as a counterfeiter, with several penalties being imposed. Enemy nations do something, tr uh, wait. Enemy nations uh, do some sometimes try to undermine a nation's economy by counterfeiting in its currency, hoping to cause inflation and destroy trust in the currency. With that in mind, we'll be right back. And welcome back uh, to continue on with uh, uh, chapter 9, page 135. As noted above, the sovereign government imposes tax liabilities as well as fines and fees in its money of account and decides how these liabilities can be paid. That is, it decides what it will accept in payment so that paid taxpayers can fulfill their obligations. Finally, the sovereign government also decides how it will make its own payments when it purchases goods and services or meets its own obligations, such as pensions or to retirees. Most modern sovereign governments make payments in their own currency and require tax payments in the same currency for, for that reason that we will examine requiring tax payments in the government and the government's currency issues that the same currency will be accepted in payment, payments made by government. What backs up the currency? There have been ongoing uh, confusion surrounding sovereign currencies. For example, many policymakers and economists have had trouble understanding why the private sector would accept currency issued by the government when it makes when we yeah you know, uh, when when it made purchases. Some have argued that it is necessary to back up a currency with a precious metal to ensure acceptance or payment. Historically, governments have sometimes maintained a reserve of gold or silver or both against their currency. It was thought that if the population could always return currency to the government to obtain uh, pre precious metal instead, then the currency would be accepted because it would be thought to be as good as gold. Sometimes the currency itself did contain precious metal, as in the case of gold coins. For example, in the U.S., the Treasury maintained gold reserves equal to 25 cents per the, uh, the value of the issued currency until the late 1960s, but American citizens were not allowed to redeem currency for gold. Only foreign holders of U.S. currency could do so. However, the U.S. and most nations have long since abandoned the practice. Even with no gold backing, the U.S. currency is still in high demand all over the world. This denominates, uh, demonstrates excuse me, that the view that currency needs precious metal backing is, is erroneous. Legal tender laws. Uh, another explanation offered for a currency's exceptions are legal tender laws. Historically, several, oh sorry, uh, sovereign governments 
have enacted legislation requiring their currencies to be accepted in payments. Indeed, the paper currency issued in the U.S. Pro proclamation, uh, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. Can uh, Canadian notes say this note is a legal is a legal tender. And Australian paper currency reads this Australian note is legal tender throughout Australia and its territories. By contrast, the paper currency of the UK simply says, I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of five pounds in case the in case of the Euro five note. On the other hand, the Euro paper currency makes no promises further. Throughout history, there have been uh, th there are many examples of governments that passed legal tender laws, but still could not create or uh, create a demand for their currencies, which were not accepted in private payments and were sometimes even rejected in payments by the government. In some cases, the penalty for refusing to accept a king's coin included the burning of a red hot coin into the forehead of the. Uh, or concentrant. I'm sorry, I can't really pronounce that word. Anyway, uh, hence there are currencies that readily circulate without any legal tender laws, as well as currencies that were shunned uh, even with legal ten uh, tender laws. Further, as we know, the U.S. dollar circulates in many countries in which it is not legal tender, and even in countries where it is used and uh, used. It is its use is dis discouraged by authorities. Uh, see, cur uh, the fiat currency. Modern currencies are often called fiat currencies because there is no promise made by government to redeem them for a precious metal. They value th their value is proclaimed by fiat. The government's legislation or legislates a new issue of currency and announces that. A coin is worth a half dollar without holding reserve of a precious metal equal in value to a half dollar. Many students are economic, uh, in on economics courses are shocked when the, they are first told that there was nothing backing the currency in their pockets but the government's fiat. While they have probably never come contemplated actually taking the currency down uh, to the treasury to exchange it for gold, they have found comfort in the erroneous belief that there was in something standing behind the currency, perhaps a reserve of precious metal that was available for redemption. The UK currencies promise to pay bearer on, on demand the sum of five pounds appears to offer a sound basis, implying that the treasury holds something in reserve that it, they can use to make the promise payments. However, if one were actually presented in the UK government a five pound note, the treasury would simply offer another five pound note or a combination of coins that sum to five pounds. Any citizen of the US or Australia would experience the same outcome at their own met treasuries. A five dollar note can be exchanged for a different five dollar note or for uh, some combination of notes and coins to make five dollars. That is the extent of the government's promise to pay. If currency, if currency cannot be exchanged for precious metal or uh, and if legal tender laws are neither nor uh, necessary nor sufficient to ensure acceptance of the currency and if the government's promise to pay is really amounts to nothing, then why would anyone accept the government's currency? Let, let us try to determine the answer. And if you haven't yet, please subscribe, comment, uh, hit the like button, uh, share, and uh, subscribe, as I said. Anyway, uh, and thanks for uh, uh, listening uh, so far. Uh, taxes drive the demand for money. One of the most important powers claimed for a sovereign government is the authority to levy and collect taxes and other payments made to government, including fees and fines. Tax obligations are levied in the na national money of accounts, for example, dollars in the U.S. and Australia, yen in Japan, pounds in the U.K., and so on. Further, the sovereign government's also, uh, government also de determines of what can be delivered to satisfy the, uh, the tax obligation. In all modern nations, it is the government-owned currency usually uh, in the form of its central bank 
reserves as we explain next uh, that is accepted in payment of taxes. And with that, I will be right back. Stay tuned. Uh, welcome back. Uh, we continue on uh, on the uh, one thirty nine of uh, of uh, chapter nine. Uh, likewise, Adam Smith uh, has argue, had argued that if the col colonies were careful to ensure they did not create too much paper money rel relative to taxes, it would not depreciate in value. Indeed, it might even circulate at a premium. He argued redemption of the notes in tax payments would remove them from circulation, keeping them scarce. Grubb argues that this was well recognized by the colonial government. The Virginia legislature took note redemption and its effort, uh, effect on controlling the value of the, of the, of the paper uh, money seriously, uh, such as illustrated in the March of 1760 Paper Money Act, which stated, uh, this in quotes, and whereas... It is of the greatest importance to preserve the credit of the paper currency of this colony, and no, and nothing can contribute more to that and then a due carry to satisfy the public that the paper bills of credit or treasury notes are properly sunk according to the true intent and meaning meaning of the uh, se several acts of assembly passed for emitting the same. And the establishment or establishing a regular method of this purpose may prevent difficulties and confusion in settling the public accounts. Uh, this emphasizes the fact that the notes were removed from circulation to protect the value of the government's paper currency, not to provide revenue that government could spend. The problem with spending the notes in excess of redemption would not be government's insolvency, but rather inflation. The taxes were meant not to raise revenue for spending. The government also uh, realized it needed to receive portion, uh, a portion of tax revenue in the form of coin. This was to ensure that it could meet its promise to redeem notes for a coin. Redemption of the tax obligations by returning paper notes by, uh, to the Treasury note uh, not only redeemed the colony, colonial, excuse me, government line uh, in the sense that its paper note debts were extinguished, but it also redeemed the taxpayers who owed taxes. The redemption is a mutual and uh, simultaneous, simulta okay, simultaneous, both the, try to, I tried to pronounce that word anyway. Uh, both the creditor, the taxpayer, and the debtor, the note issuing treasury were redeemed. At the same time, the debtor taxpayer was redeemed uh, of the duty to pay taxes to the creditor and treasury. The four entries on the balance sheets were all um, wiped clean simultaneously. Okay, that's the, word. That's the actual freaking like pronunciation of that word. Anyways, wiped clean. Creation of notes preceded these redemption in tax payment. Note creation through government spending are logically come uh, logically comes before note redemption through taxation. Indeed, it would have been impossible for the colonists to pay the new taxes given the chronic shortage of coin unless the notes were issued and spent first. Nor would the government have needed to impose the new taxes if it was not going to spend the money or notes. What this shows is that modern interpretations of redemptions, uh, redemption are based on a narrow definition that applies when the issuer of a currency promises to redeem that currency for either gold, or which is the gold standard, or a foreign currency fixed exchange rate, and a promise exchange rate of uh, a promise exchange rate. Of course, there are issuers who make such a promise. However, the more common and more fundamental promise is that acceptance, accepting of one's own liability and payments due, such as taxes, 
go to the issuer of the sovereign currency. Even in this case, the sovereign can the sovereign can also promise to redeem the currency for gold or foreign currency. The Virginia colony promised redemption in English coin. We see this as an additional promise that applies in some cases, but a promise that is now rare among developed nations. The EMU nations are uh, an ex exception. The promise to accept its own currency in payment is the more is the more common and indeed universal promise of a redemption, and is sufficient to drive a currency. Financial stocks and flows denominated in the national money of account. Financial notes and financial flows are denominated in the nation, national money of account. While working, the employee earns a flow of wages and are denominated in money, effectively accumulating a monetary claim on employer uh, uh, on the pro employer. Uh, see chapter six. One pay on payday, the employer uh, eliminates the obligation by providing a wage payment via, say, an electronic uh, transfer to the worker's bank account. That is a liability of the employer's bank. Again, this that is denominated in the national money of account. It desired the worker uh, can, if desired, the worker can draw on the bank deposit and receive the government's currency again, an IOU of the government. Any disposable income that is not used for consumption purchases represent a flow of saving accumulated as stock of wealth. In, the, in this case, the saving is held as a bank deposit that is as financial wealth. These monetary stocks and flows are uh, conceptually, not, conceptually nothing more than account, uh, account entries. Measured in the money of account, we can easily imagine doing away with coins and paper notes as well as checkbooks with all payments made through electronic entries using computers uh, connected via the internet and all financial wealth and could be uh, similarly be accounted for without a, a use of paper. In chapter five, we carefully examined the definitions of stocks, for example, wealth and flows, for example, uh, income spending, and saving as well as the relationship between them. Next section, the financial system as an electronic scoreboard. The modern financial system can be seen as the uh, elaborated or uh, uh, elaborated uh, elaborate system of record keeping, a sort of financial scoring of the same life in the cap uh, cap capitalist economy. Financial scoring can be compared with a scoreboard as a sporting event. When a team scores the final score, awards points, uh, official award score, score awards points, and electronic pulse uh, pulses, uh, yeah, pulses are sent into the appropriate combination of LED, uh, LEDs so that the scoreboard will show the number of points awarded. As the game progresses, points uh, totals are adjusted to, for each team. The points have no real physical presence. They simply do reflect a record of the, uh, the performance of each team according to the rules of the game. There are no backed by, uh, they are not backed by anything, although they are valuable because the team that accumulates the most points is deemed the winner and perhaps rewarded with fame and fortune. Further, in accordance with applicable applicable rules, um, points might be taken away after review of officials to determine that rules were broken and the and, the, and that penalties should be assessed. The points that are taken uh, away don't really go anywhere. They simply disappear as the scorekeeper deducts them from the score. Similarly, in the game of life, earned income leads to points credited to uh, the score that is kept by financial institutions. Unlikely uh, sports corn, uh, contest in the game of life, every point that is awarded to one player is deducted from the score of another, either reducing the, uh, the, pay, uh, the payer's assets or increasing their liabilities according to uh, accountants and the game of life are very careful to ensure that financial accounts may ba uh, always balance. 
the payment of wage leads to a debt of employee of the employer's score at the bank and a credit to the employee's score but at the same time the wage and payment uh, eliminates the employer's uh, uh, implicit obligation to pay wages as well as the employee employee's legal claim to wages so while the game of life is a bit more complicated than the football game, the idea that, some, that record keeping in terms of money is a lot like record keeping in terms of points can be can help us to rem remember that money is not a, not a thing, but a, rather a unit of account in which we keep track of all of the debits and credits uh, or points. When thinking about the scores, the currency issuing government might record via government spending the currency into existence. It doesn't make sense to say that government can run out of money. That would be saying a game must be terminated at some point because the schedule and because uh, scheduled and because the score had run out of scores to post on the scoreboard. We will come back to that point in later chapters. Uh, Section 9.3, Floating versus Fixed Exchange Rate Regimes. An exchange rate is the amount of currency A that can be purchased by a unit of currency B in what we call the foreign exchange market. We will consider these markets in more detail in Chapter 24. Government can also government can allow its currency to be freely exchanged at whatever value the foreign currency market determines Funding rates or try to manage the exchange by using under uh, multilateral agreements between nations or fixed rates. These different arrangements have implications for the conduct of economic policy, which will, which we will briefly consider in this chapter or in this. Uh, wait a minute. In this, okay. Uh, <laughs> it seemed like uh, something was missing, but uh, I'm guessing not. It was in previous sections, we dealt with the same government that do not promise to convert their currencies on demand into precious metals or anything else. When, when a $5 note is presented to the U.S. Treasury, it can be used to pay taxes or can be exchanged for some combination of note and notes and coins that, that sums to $5 but the U.S. government will not convert it to anything else. Further, the U.S. government does not promise to maintain the exchange rate of the U.S. dollars against other currencies at any particular level. This is uh, the typical situation for most nations. Most of this textbook will, constant, will be concerned with sovereign currencies which operate with floating exchange rates against other currencies so that they are not convertible at a, at a fixed, uh, fixed rate to another currency. Examples of such currency include the U.S. dollar, the Australian dollar, the Canadian dollar, the U.K. pound, the Japanese yen, the Turkish lira, the Mexican peso, the Argentina peso, and so on. What are the difference between fixed and floating exchange rates, and what are the implications of this distinction? Next section, the gold standard and fixed exchange rates. A century or so ago, many nations operated with the gold standard in which the country did not only promise to redeem its currency for gold, but also promised to make this redemption at a fixed exchange rate. An, an example of a fixed exchange rate is the promise to convert 35 U.S. dollars to one ounce of gold. For many years, that was indeed the official U.S. exchange rate. Other nations have also dropped, uh, adopted, excuse me, fixed exchange rates uh, paid the value of their currency uh, either to gold or after the Second World War to U.S. dollar. For example, at the inception of the post-war system uh, known as the Brentwood system, the official exchange rate for the UK pound uh, per US dollar was 0 0.2481. On December uh, 27th, 1945, this is, uh, this is the equivalent to a, a person receiving four US dollars for each UK pound presented for conversion. As all other currencies in the system were set relative to the US dollar, this also set their value relative to each other. So on December 27, 1945, uh, 119.1 French fr uh, francs exchanged for one U.S. dollar, which meant that 480 francs were required to purchase one U U.K. pound. In Chapter 24, we will learn how to interpret exchange rate uh, quotations and to calculate various prosperities. 
in order to make good on its promises to convert its currency at fixed exchange rates, such a nation had to keep a reserve of foreign currency and or gold. For example, if a lot of UK pounds were prom uh, presented by or presented for, excuse me, converted a conversion to U.S. dollars, for example, by foreign ex foreign central banks to the Bank of England, the U.K.'s reserves of foreign, mostly dollar, a currency could be depleted rapidly. There were three strategies that could be adopted by the UK government to avoid running out of foreign currency reserves, but none of them were in very pleasant. They include A, alter the value of the pound against the US dollar, that is devalue, B, borrow foreign currency uh, reserves, or C, deflate the uh, economy using higher interest rates and or fiscal cutbacks to curtail imports and attract capital flow. Under this fixed exchange rate system, countries with trade deficits, exports less than imports, always had difficulty maintaining the agreed exchange parity because the trade deficit manifests in foreign exchange markets as an excess supply of the nation's currency relative to other currencies, or all other currencies, rather. This is because when a nation sells exports, foreign buyers must supply their own currency in return for that nation's currency. And then, and when a nation buys imports, it must supply its own currency in return for the currency of the nation from in, for which it is important. Thus, a trade deficit amounts to an excess supply of the deficit nation's currency in the foreign exchange market, which pushes the price exchange rate downward. This uh, to arrest the decline uh, in the exchange rate, the central bank is required to buy up its currency in the foreign exchange market using stocks of foreign currency, which eliminates the excess supply. However, nations with chronic trade deficits soon, sooner or later run out of stores of foreign currencies. These pressures eventually undermine the, the viability of the Bretton Woods system and it collapsed in August of 71. Be right back. Hey, welcome back. Uh, we are now at the Philippine exchange rate uh, portion of this uh, chapter. In August 1971, U.S. President Nixon abandoned the U.S. participation in the fixed exchange rate system because the U.S. was unable to continue to guarantee conversion of U.S. dollars into gold at the agreed price. But, uh, sorry, many countries followed suit. This meant that these governments uh, no longer promised to convert their currency to uh, currency or gold at a fixed rate. As a result, the relative value of the currencies against one another were, were allowed to float, meaning that they would be determined hour by hour according to forces of demand and supply in that foreign exchange market. Today, it is easy to convert most currencies, including floating currencies, into any other major currency at, pri at private banks and at kiosks in the international airports. Currency exchange rates, these uh, enact, sorry, foreign exchange enact these conversions at the current uh, exchange rate set in international markets, minus the, the fee chain charged for the transaction. These exchange rates uh, change day by day or even minute by minute, uh, fluctuating to match uh, demand from those trying to obtain the change day by day or sorry a currency in question and supply uh, from those offering that particular currency in exchange for another currencies the determination of exchange rate in the floating exchange rate uh, system is exceeding complex exceedingly complex the uh, international value of u.s dollar for example might be influ influenced by such faction uh, factors as the demand for u.s assets the U.S. trade balance, uh, U.S. interest rates relative to those in the rest of the world, U.S. inflation, and U.S. growth re relative to that uh, in the rest of the world. So many factors are involved 
that no statistical model can uh, reliably predict uh, movement of exchange rates that has has been developed yet. What is important for our uh, analysis, however, is that with a floating exchange rate, a government does not need to fear that it would run out of foreign currencies reserves or gold reserves for the simple reason that it is not converted into domestic currency to foreign currency at a fixed exchange rate. Indeed, the government does not have to promise to make any conversions at all. In practice, governments operating within uh, floating exchange rates hold foreign currency reserves and they offer currency exchange services for the convenience of their financial institutions. However, the conversions are done at current market exchange rates rather than keeping the exchange rate at a prescribed level. I'm guessing this is where conservatives back in the 80s and 90s got the whole we borrow money from China uh, twist to whatever the heck they were trying to say. Uh, pretty much austerity. Uh, but that's my thought on that side note. Uh, anyway, so prescribed level, governments intervene into currency and exchange markets to try to nudge the exchange rate in the desired direction. They also will use macroeconomic policy, including monetary and fiscal policy, as dis as discussed in, ch in Chapter 20, uh, in an attempt to af uh, affect exchange rates. So sometimes with, uh, with this works, and sometimes it does not. The point is that with a floating exchange rate, attempts to influence exchange rate uh, are discretionary. By contrast, with a fixed exchange rate, uh, government must use policy to try to keep the exchange rate fixed. The floating exchange rate in, uh, ensures that the government can has greater freedom to pursue uh, pursue other policy goals, such as maintaining a full employment, sufficient economy, economic growth, and price stability. How it might do that is discussed in later chapters. Now we're in section 9.4. And the IOUs denominated in national currency, currency, uh, uh, government, and non-government. In previous sections, we uh, have noted that assets and liabilities are denominated in money of account, which is chosen by a national government and given force through the, the mechanism of taxation. But the floating exchange rate, the government is uh, uh, government's own IOUs, its currency, are non-convertible in the sense that the government makes no promise to convert them to precious metal, to foreign currency, or to anything else. Instead, of, uh, it promises to accept its own IOUs in payments made to itself, mostly tax payments, but also payments of fees and fines. This is the necessary and fundamental promise made uh, the issuer of an IOU, but must accept the IOU in payment. So long as the government agrees to accept its own IOUs in tax payments, the, gen the government's IOUs will be in demand, at least in tax payments and probably for other uses as well. Similarly, private account of IOUs are uh, also promised to accept their own liabilities. For example, if you have a loan with your bank, you always pay the principal and interest on the loan by writing a check on your own deposit account at the bank. Actually, all modern bank systems operate a check clearing facility so that each bank accepts checks drawn on other banks to in the in the country. This allows anyone with a debit, oh debt, excuse me, not debit, but debt due to any check clearing facility then operates to settle accounts among the banks. This topic will be discussed in detail in Chapter 20. The important point is that banks accept their own liabilities, checks drawn on deposits in payments on debts due to banks. The loans, bank, the loans banks have made just the government accept their own liabilities, the currency, and payments on debts due to government's tax liability. Leveraging. There is one big difference between government and banks. However, banks do promise to convert their liabilities to something. You can present a check to your bank to payment uh, for payment in currency, what it normally call, called a uh, cashing a check, or you can simply withdraw cash at the automatic tailor, tailor, teller uh, machine or ATM. 
from one of your bank accounts is either in either ca uh, case the bank IOU is converted to a government IOU. Banks normally promise to make these conversions either on demand in the case of a demand deposits, which are normally checks accounts, che uh, check accounts, or after a specific uh, specified time period in the case of time or term deposits, including savings accounts and certif certifications of deposit known as CDs, perhaps with the penalty for each withdrawal, with early withdrawal, sorry. Uh, because banks make this promise to convert and uh, on demand, they must either hold reserves of currency or have quick access to them. The reserves take the form of bolt cash plus deposits held at the current bank, or sorry, central bank. Note that they need to hold only a small amount of reserves uh, against their, their deposits because they know that redemptions or withdrawals over any uh, over any short period will take a tiny fraction of their total uh, deposits. The fraction of reserves against deposits is called reserve ratio. We can think of deposits as leveraging the reserves. For example, in the U.S., the ratio of reserves against bank deposits is around 1%. That means leverage ratio is 100 to 1. Banks hold a relative small amount of currency in their in the vaults to handle conversions on demand, but most other reserves take the form of deposits at the central bank. If they need more currency, they ask the central bank to send in the armored truck with the desired notes and coins. For our purposes here, bank reserves deposits at the central bank are equivalent to vault cash because a bank can immediately convert them to currency to meet a cash withdrawals. There is no functional difference between cash held in bank vaults and reserve deposits held at the central bank. We can include both as currency government liabilities with zero time to maturity. Banks don't like to hold a lot of vault cash or reserves, nor do they need to do so in normal circumstances. Holding tons, or sorry, holding lots of cash on the pr uh, promise, premises could increase the attractiveness of bank robbers. But the main reason for minimizing holdings is that it, cost, that it is costly to hold currency. The most obvious costs are the, uh, are the vault and the need to hire security guards. However, uh, more important to banks is the fact that holding reserves does not earn much profit. And banks would rather hold loans as a assets because debt, uh, debtors pay interest on those loans. For, that, for this reason, banks operate with higher leverage ratio, holding a very tiny fraction of, the, of their, their assets in the form of reserves against their deposit liabilities. So long as only a small percentage of their de depositors and try to convert deposits to cash on any given day. This is not a problem, however, in the cash of uh, the case of the bank run in which a large number of customers try to convert the deposits to cash on the same day. The bank will have to obtain currency from the central bank. This can even lead to a lender of last resort action by the central bank and lending currency reserves to a bank facing a run. These are issues uh, that we'll address in Chapter 23. <clears throat> Excuse me. Clearing account extin extinguished IOUs. There is another reason for bank hole recruit reserves. When you write a check on your bank account to pay a bill, the receipt of the check will, the recipient of the check will deposit in their own bank, which is probably a different bank. <clears throat> Excuse me. Their bank will present the check to your bank for payment. This is called clearing accounts. Banks clear accounts using government IOUs, and for that reason, banks maintain reserve deposits at the central bank. More importantly, they have access to more reserves should they ever need them, both through borrowing from other banks, which is interbank uh, market for reserves, an overnight market where banks lend to 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 and borrow from each other, or through borrowing them from the central bank. All modern financial systems have developed procedures to ensure banks can get currency and reserves as necessary to clear accounts among themselves and with their depositors. The central bank is duty bound to provide banks with sufficient reserves should they fall short on any particular day. 
when First National Bank received uh, receives a check drawn on that uh, Second National Bank, it asks the central bank to debit the reserves of Second National Bank or National Second National and to credit its own reserves. This is now uh, hand uh, handled. There we go. And electronically, note that. Wait a minute. Yeah, note that while se Second National assets will be reduced by the amount of reserves debited, uh, its liabilities check deposit will be reduced by the same amount. Similarly, when a depositor uses the ATM to withdraw a currency, the bank's assets, cash reserves, are reduced and the IOUs to the depositor and li the, liabil the liabilities and deposit account are reduced at the same, uh, by the same amount. Other uh, business firms use bank liabilities for clearing their own accounts. For example, a retail uh, firm typically receives products from wholesalers on the basis of the promise to pay after a specific time period, usually 30 days in the U.S. Wholesalers hold these IOUs until the end of the period at which time the retailers pay by a check drawn on their bank account or by electronic transfer from their account to the account of the wholesaler. At this point, the retailer's IOUs held by the wholesaler are canceled. Alternatively, the wholesaler might not be willing to wait until the end of the period for payment. In this case, the wholesaler can sell the retail's, and retailer's IOUs as a di at a discount for less than the, the amount the re retailer promised to pay the wholesaler can sell the uh, retailer I'll use it. Okay, I already read that one. <laughs> to pay at the end of the period. There we go. The discount is effectively interest that the wholesaler is willing to pay to get the funds earlier than promised. The retailer effectively earns interest the difference between the amount paid for the IOUs and the amount paid to the wholesaler to extinguish the IOUs. Again, the, re the retailer's IOU is canceled by delivering a bank liability. The holder of the retailer's IOU receives credit to their own bank account, as well as, as we will see in Chapter 23, according to the basis of both commercial banking and of interest rates. That rhymed. Anyway, um, a pyramid, uh, pyram pyramiding currency. This section. Another important point is that the the private financial liability can only uh, can not only denominate in the government's money of account. They also uh, are ultimately convertible into the government's currency. As we have discussed, banks explicitly promise to convert their liability to currency either immediately in the case of demand deposits or with other delay in the case of signed deposits. Other private firms mostly use bank liabilities to clear their own accounts, especially, essentially, excuse me, essentially, this means that, this means they are promising to convert their liabilities to bank liabilities, paying by check on a specific date or according to other conditions specified in that contract. For this reason, they must have deposited or have access to deposits with banks to make the payments. Things can get even more complex than this because there is a wider range of financial institutions and even non-financial institutions offering financial services that can provide payment services. These organizations can make payments for other firms when with net clearing among, among these non-bank financial institutions occurring using the liability liabilities of banks. Banks, in turn, cl uh, clear accounts using government liabilities. There can, there, there could thus be six degrees of separation, many layers of financial uh, leveraging between a creditor and a debtor, uh, debtor uh, involved in clearing accounts. We can think of a py uh, pyramid of li liabilities with uh, different, uh, with different types of corresponding to the degree of separation from the central bank. Perhaps the bottom layer consists of the IOU of uh, households that are held by another household, by firms engaged in production by banks and by other financial institutions. The important point is that 
households usually clear accounts by using liabilities used by those higher in the debt pyramid, typically financial institutions. The next layer up from the bottom cons consists of the IOUs of firms engaged in production with, with the liability held mostly by financial institutions higher in the debt pyramid, although some are different uh, directly held by households and by other production firms and whose most, mostly uh, clear, clear accounts using liabilities used by the financial institutions, sometimes called shadow banks, or as I would call them, uh, the, uh, what, the lenders, money lenders. Anyway, at the next layer, we have non-bank financial institutions, which in turn uh, clear accounts using the banks uh, whose liabilities are higher in the, in the pyramid. Banks are banks use government liabilities for clearing. Finally, we, uh, for net clearing. There we go. Finally, the government is at the top of the pyramid with no liabilities higher than its non-convertible IOUs. The shape of the the pyramid is instruct um, is instructive for two reasons. First, there is a hierar hierarchical uh, arrange, uh, arrangement whereby liabilities used uh, issued excuse me by those higher in the pyramid are generally more accessible acceptable excuse me in some respects this is due to higher uh, credit worthiness because the government's liabilities are free of credit risk as we move down the pyramid through bank liabilities towards non-financial business liabilities and finally to the IOUs of households risk tends to rise Although this is not a firm and fast, uh, firm and fast rule. Second, the liability at each level typically leverage the uh, liabilities at the higher levels, and the in this sense, the whole pyramid is based on leveraging a relative smaller number of government IOUs. This is a constant, so to which we will return to the next section. Figure 9.1 shows the pyramid as per the concept developed by Hyman Miskey and Duncan Foley and extended by Stephanie Bell, otherwise known as Stephanie Kelton, which provides a visual representation of the concept of leverage. At the top of the pyramid uh, are the government's liabilities, with which we refer to as monetary base and constitutes the sum of all bank. Before, oh wait, bank reserves, there we go. Held in the central bank clearing accounts and outstanding currency, uh, outs, yeah, outs, yeah, outstanding currency, notes and coins as uh, at the bottom of the pyramid, as well as we include all other money denominated liabilities. These could include the IOUs of, of non-financial firms, as well as those households. 9.5 section, use of term money, confusion, and precision. Before concluding this chapter, we will briefly distinguish between our use of the term money and the way it is often used. Many, uh, many, money, there we go, is often used in, uh, colloquially to refer to income as in asking how much money do you make at your job as we discussed in chapter five in income is a flow measured in nominal terms and uh, sorry that is in the money of account in the book uh, in this book we will always carefully distinguish the flows between stocks and will not use the term money in the place of income the term money is also often used to indicate a particular uh, liability, such as the uh, demand deposit liability of a bank or the currency IOU of the government. In fact, as we have discussed above, all financial liabilities are denominated in the money of account. It is thus rather arbitrary to call some of the some of these money uh, and to exclude the others. Further, each time one is, uses the term money to refer to money denominated liabilities. In general, one must provide a list of those that are included as money or a, or a list of those that are excluded. Otherwise, we can never be sure what the speaker means. Throughout this book, we will carefully distinguish between the money of account, the US dollar or the Australian dollar, for example, and spe uh, specific money denominated liabilities, demand deposits issued by banks or currency issued by the government, for example. 
The term money simply refers to the unit of account chosen by the government to denominate tax liabilities and payment or payments made to government, the dollar in both the U.S. and Australia. As we discuss, money does not uh, does not have physical existence, for, uh, but rather in the unit in which we can keep track of debts and debt uh, credits, much as a point, uh, much as a point in the unit of account used in the game of football to keep track of goals, score just as the second or uh, just as the score in football is determined or denominated, excuse me, to goals, a coins denominated in dollars or fractions of a dollar. A goal is uh, a football takes a physical form, a player kicking the football into a specific area, but the points but the points used to account for the goal do not have any physical presence. In the same manner, a $10 bill or $10 note issued by a government has a physical form, a piece of paper imprinted with ink, but the $10 owed by the government, uh, government that is accounts for, uh, for do not. We can think of the paper note as just the written record of the government's IOU. What does it owe you? The right to discharge you your ten dollars of tax liability using the ten dollar record of government IOUs. In conclusion, in this chapter, we de defined and examined the characteristics of a sovereign money system, one in which government issue its own currency. We explained that most countries around the world today and back through history have. Uh, each adopted their own currency because this is a link to a country's independence and fiscal sovereignty. We also explained why floating exchange rate regimes generally provide the greatest fiscal and monetary policy space. By contrast, pegging an exchange rate to a foreign currency or to gold generally reduces policy space and creates the poss possibility that a nation with, will be forced to default on the promised uh, to convert its currency on space and creates of oh, weight on demand. There we go. While most, while many, excuse me, people believe that it is necessary to back a currency which something of a value, gold or foreign currency, this chapter introduced the concept that taxes or other obligations drive money. In other words, if citizens need the government's currency to pay taxes, then that will be sufficient to guarantee that the currency will be accepted. Finally, the concept of leveraging of the state's currency was discussed. Private detail debts and credits are denominated in the government's money of account. The same money uh, account in, uh, of account in which the currency is denominated. Some of these private debts, more notably bank de demand deposits, are made convertibly or convertible on demand to the state's currency. These are cleared using the state's currency. Uh, other types of private debts are cleared using bank liabilities. This led to the notion of a pyramid of li liabilities with the government's liabilities at the top, leveraging by those uh, leveraged by those lower in the pyramid. Now, tomorrow uh, will be Friday, but also will be uh, Chapter 10, Money and Banking. Join me for then. And for right now, uh, please subscribe, and please uh, comment, and please hit that notification button and bell, and share. Uh, thanks for listening. Um, I hope that you got some education out of this. I hope I didn't misread too many uh, words, and I hope that you got the gist of the chapter I was trying to read you in, gist of what modern monetary theory is. Uh, thank you again for listening. Uh, once again, please subscribe, please uh, hit the bell, hit like, comment, and share that you know what I have it. Thank you, and peace out for now.